Well, blessed Thursday to you as we come with your daily encouragement. And yesterday we were cut a little short with our story of Pergamum. And um, that is because it was a little longer chapter. Now, I just want to stress, if you haven't seen uh, yesterday's, you probably won't know what we're talking about in today's. So I'll just say simply, watch yesterday's. But we're talking about the religious practices that were happening in Pergamum. Not necessarily among Christians, but Christians became complicit in it because they did a couple things that probably were designed to build camaraderie in the town of Pergamum. You see, being part of a religious sect meant that you didn't participate in public events. And there are a lot of people, you know, will say that there has to be a minimum standard of patriotism in a town or in a place. And and so this was kind of what the Christians were struggling with. How far do I participate in these events? And one of them was to give sacrifice to the god or the protector, and in this case, Zeus or Jupiter, the, the lead god who is referred to as the throne of Satan. And you, part of participating was that part of an animal was sacrificed, the other part was shared among the people as a common meal. Paul dealt with that in his letter when he said, you know, for some that's okay because these demons don't have power, so we can eat whatever meal we want to together. I know when we go to the grocery store, we don't worry about whether the meat has been sacrificed or not. It's be it would become a moot issue to some extent. And so some, Paul just says, are okay with eating meat, even if it's been offered. Others view it as a, a difficulty, a witness thing. And so he simply says, don't do it outwardly. Don't be offensive to others if someone has a weak conscience. We all have differences of opinion when it comes to eating. And, you know, some are vegetarian, some are not. That's the what Paul, one of the issues Paul was dealing with. And he's basically saying we just need to put Christ first and to be aware of people's difficulties, not to be outwardly offensive. We might say the case in music. Some people like a certain type of music. Other people might find offense to the type of music we like. But we accommodate. We don't necessarily put that as our worship music. And that's one of the difficulties we get into with worship. What type of music is suitable for the Lord and what type of music is not suitable to the Lord? But that's another topic, but it's related to what's going on here. Another one, though, is much more personal, and Paul gets into it in 1 Corinthians, and that is practicing fornication. A lot of these temples had prostitutes, and part of the ritual practice in order to have a good crop was to sleep with the temple prostitutes. I know that sounds crazy from our standpoint, but it was considered one of the ways to get the ground working as far as the the crops were concerned. It was considered one of those lucky things that you did as a, a male farmer. And Paul basically says, you're committing adultery. Don't do it. Don't uh, bring the body of Christ into communion with um, a party that is not of Christ. That's simply what you're doing if you are participating in it. And now Jesus, with his two-edged sword, is calling those practices to account. Don't do them. And so in verse 15, he says, So you also have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Once again, we don't really have a good reference on who these people are. Repent then. If not, I will come to you soon and make war against them with the sword of my mouth. Now, we have to remember, there's a judgmental side of the sword, and there is a healing side to the sword, but it first is judgmental. We are born sinners, and we need to be freed. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And once again, ear means listen. We all have ears, but an ear to listen and to everyone who conquers, once again, who endures, words of going through life as a conqueror. I will give some a hidden manna, a secret manna. Now, the manna of the wilderness was a manna that everyone could participate with. It was obvious it fell down. But 
many have speculated what a secret mana is, and it's basically a mana that comes for the few that will be faithful who will not participate with sharing meat dedicated to idols, who will not um, participate with the fornicators of the temple ritual. If you endure and are persecuted, there is a secret bread. You know, when we say, give us this day our daily bread, there's a secret nutrient that can help us through that trial and tribulation. And to everyone who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna and will give it a white stone, and on that white stone is written a new name that no one knows except the one who receives it. Now that one sounds maybe even more mysterious, but let's put it in a context. A name was considered a power. And if you had the name of someone, you were considered one to have power over them. Now, I think the closest thing I can come to this would be, in many cases, some people refer to me as pastor, but some are colloquial and, you know, co and I'm comfortable with that, just refer to me as Matt or Matthew. But some like the title. And some would say that the title protects your name from being too familiar. Maybe that happens for teachers, too. You're referred to Mr., Mrs., or Miss. And you usually use your last name. You don't usually use your first name with your teachers. It's considered a sign of disrespect, but it also could be considered a sign of power. You didn't just casually refer to your teacher as Bob or your pastor by some other nickname or something. You know, but there's always a tension in that. But it also had a spiritual context. By having that familiar name, you had power over them. And so there is kind of that dimension even with the name of God. We have the word Elohim, which means God or gods. Kind of a generic name for whether it's the God of Israel or any other gods. But our God had a personal name, and his name was Yahweh. And the ancient Hebrews would not even renounce that name. They wouldn't put any pronunciation remarks on the name of God. In fact, they would just simply say the word Adonai, which means Lord, because the sacred name of God was too sacred. Once again, by invoking that name, one could be considered that you're putting yourself equal to God. And that's what Satan did, according to Scripture, considered himself equal with God, putting himself on the same wave or plane length. And so what, what it seems that the Lord is telling him, I'm going to give you a white stone with a secret name that will be your power, will be the one that the world and the demons and the Satanists and the others who are against you won't be able to have power over you. And it seems that that's what that white stone and new name is all about with the hidden manna. God has something even greater in us. And what do we know? How do we apply that? We'd say that that would be the same as our baptism. We've been born into a good family. We've been given a last name, but we've been given a greater name in the waters of baptism, a power that is greater than anybody could ever imagine, a hidden name, a hidden manna, a hidden resource that the devils of this world cannot conquer. And so that's what the Lord is telling the people of Pergamum. You have persecutions. You're tolerating some people. Stop doing it. Kick them out. But know that you have a secret power that the world cannot conquer. But you will conquer for being faithful to my name. God bless you today. Trust that these continue to be words of encouragement. Tomorrow we'll go into the town of Thyatira and uh, another town with another challenge to the Lord and to the world. Take care. God bless. We'll see you next time.